Today I want to share with you a message. And this is something that uh, for me years ago uh, really, really blessed me. The knowledge and the truth that I'm about to share with you. The title of today's sermon is called, Why Did God Become Man? Why did God choose to become a man? I want to share with you from Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Philippians is a letter that Paul wrote uh, to the church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. It's a short passage, so let's read it together in one voice, in loud voice. Let's read it together. Let's begin. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though He was God, He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, He gave up His divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. You know, whether you realize this or not, but I am a very analytical thinker. What I mean by that is, is for me, I cannot just accept something because people tell me. To me, it has to make sense. I don't necessarily argue with people, but when I hear something, I say to myself, does this make sense? Is this person telling the truth? You know, or is this possible? I'm a very analytical thinker. And I approach the Bible, I approach God and, and my faith in the same way. There's no way I can believe something simply because people said this is true. And in the past, I shared with you that in my early stages of my faith, I said, God, I may not understand everything, but I choose to believe. I choose to follow. And then at the early stage of my faith, Actually, I struggled with many things because uh, there are many things that I had not yet resolved in my heart. There were still many things that still wasn't clear to me. And in my mind, I didn't resolve. I couldn't resolve. And one of the issues that I really struggled in my early faith was people have always said, you know, Jesus Christ is God, was God incarnation as a man. God that became man in the person of Jesus Christ. And my understanding of God is this, that God is an all-powerful God. He's an omnipotent, He's omniscient, He's omnipresent. That means God is everywhere all the time. And God knows everything, like the song that we sang to God. He knows my name. And God is omnipotent in that He is all-powerful. He can do anything. A God who created the universe with a single word. I mean, He, you know, we say the word powerful, but it doesn't do justice to describe God's power to be able to create the universe with a single word. And I struggle with this incarnation because the incarnation basically tells us that God became man to die for our sins on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins. And I struggle with that because I said to myself, if God is so omnipotent, if God is so powerful, why couldn't He erase the sins of all mankind with a snap of His finger? Why couldn't He? Why did He have to go through all this process of becoming a man, humbling Himself, God becoming a man, and suffering, enduring humiliation, and the ultimate humiliation of dying on the cross? Why did God do all of those things? And unless I resolve that, I didn't have peace in my heart. But let me just say that when I did resolve this issue, I experienced this great sense of joy, and not only joy, but excitement, because it all made sense. It all made sense. And because it made so much sense, my faith and my belief in God just continued to grow. One of the greatest mysteries mystery, mysteries of Christianity has been the question of why did God choose to become man? I mentioned earlier that you know when we talk about God, usually we use the we describe God in three ways that I mentioned that He is omniscient, omnipresent, He's omnipotent, He's all powerful. And we use that a lot. But sometimes we miss God when we only use those terms to describe Him. 
There are three words that also that describe God very well that actually help to explain why God chose to become man. And that is that our God is not only om omniscient, omnipresent, but omnipotent, but He is also a God who is just, a God who is holy, and God who is love. And when we understand this God who is just, and God who is holy, and the God who is love, this whole God becoming man, incarnation, it makes so much sense. Let me start off by saying, talking to you about the truth of God who is just. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4, it states, He, speaking of God, is the rock. His works are perfect. And all His ways are just. He says, all, not most, not sometime, not most, all, his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is He. See, our God is a just God. He's a God of justice. He's a God of righteousness. What I mean by that is God is incapable of doing what is wrong. God is incapable of allowing injustice. If God is capable of doing one wrong, that would eliminate Him from being God. To say that you know, God is 99% perfect is to say He is not a God at all. See, God means that He is perfectly just. He is perfect in every way. To say He is God is to say God is just perfectly, 100%. Without any imperfection, He is perfect. How does that relate to us? It means that even though God created us, even though God loves us, He cannot allow injustice to rule our lives. He cannot allow the sin in our lives to go unpunished. Because to do so would make Him imperfect, and to do so, that would not make Him God. That means that no matter how much God loves us, he has to. He has to deal with our injustice. He has to judge our sins. Because that is His nature. And because of that, there will be consequence for all of our sins. Just as there's a good reward for our obedience, there's also, there must also exist punishment for our disobedience. And God became man because man had to be punished for their sins. According to Romans 6.23, it says that punishment was separation from God. It's not going to make complete sense now, but know that the first reason God had to become man because man had to be punished for their sins. Because why? Because God is holy. Which leads us to the next reason why God became man. God became man because He is holy. The word holy literally means set apart. To say that God is holy is that there is none, there is none that equals to God. There is nothing in this universe that comes even close to being at the level of God. God is holy. He is at another level. You know, people oftentimes talk about athletes like that. You know, there's Michael Jordan, and then there's everyone else. God is holy. He is way set apart. He is in His own world, obviously. That's why it makes Him God. That's what makes Him God. He is holy. He is set apart. How is He set apart? Why is it that God is so holy, set apart from all of us? One reason. God is perfect, He is pure, and He is sinless. Let's prove this point. Raise your hand here if there's, if there's a person here who has never sinned in their life. Who has never did a wrong deed in their life. None? Raise your hand if you've never had an evil thought in your mind. Raise your hand if you, uh, uh, well, okay, never lied. Really? Liars, all of you, liars. Get out of my church. 
All of us are sinners. Raise your hand if you, okay. If you sin less than 10 times, raise your hand. 100 times. 200? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you lied again, man. <laughs> If I were to calculate, I would, I would say that I probably lied. Well, I don't want to say lie, but, you know, I, I deceive people maybe a certain way with my actions, maybe how I phrase things. I hide, the, I hide the truth to my wife, to my children, to you. I am imperfect. I am a sinner. We're all in the same group, except for one, and that is our God. He is set apart from us. He is totally set apart from us. He is in a different class by himself. He is holy. He is absolutely pure, righteous, holy, sinless. He is perfect. He is set apart God. And because God is so holy, He, he cannot, He cannot coexist. He cannot allow sin and imperfection to be part of His life. He just can't. Just as water and oil cannot mix because they're just such two different substances that just cannot mix. Even if you put them together, they will still separate from one another because their nature is different. And just as, you know, in that illustration, same thing with God. God is so holy, He cannot coexist with sin. It's just not in His nature. For God to say, you know, for God to allow sin to be part of His life, to be lied, to be part of his life, to be unjust, to be part of his life, then you know what? That would not make him God because he is not pure and holy. And that is why when man committed sin, God had to pass judgment because he is a just God. And that judgment, the consequence of that sin was separation from God. Bible tells us that that place is called hell. See, God cannot, even though no matter how much He loves us, He cannot allow us to be in His presence when we have sin in our lives. And some people say, you know, why would God send away, you know, send uh, us to, you know, hell, such an evil place? Hell is an evil place, not because God created an evil place. Hell is a terrible place because it is a place absent of God's goodness. Think about all the goodness, love, purity, compassion, joy, happiness. Those are all the fruit of God's Spirit. That is all part of God's nature. And when we sin, we can no longer be part of that nature because God is just too holy that he cannot allow sin to be part of his life God became man because God in his form could not coexist with sin but but as flesh and blood but as human being and as a man a finite imperfect being, God could coexist with sin. That is why God became man in the person of Jesus. But why would God choose to become a man? Why would God choose to go through such extreme measures for man? Which leads us to the third and last point. God did what He did because God is love. Because God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it states, And so we know and rely on the love, of love, on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in Him. See, so God is a holy God. And He is a just God. And because He's so holy and just, He had, He has to, for Him not to, would make Him, God, would make him a God of injustice. So he had, to, he had to punish man and, 
and penalize all of us to eternal separation from Him. But it was His love for us that caused Him to make the ultimate sacrifice. God became man to die for our sins. Let me just say this, first of all, that God becoming man is the ultimate act of humility and humiliation. I mean, you think about it. We use the word God. We use the word God, you know. But we don't really think about how great God is and how puny and finite we are compared to Him. I mean, the greatest person, the greatest athlete, who would you say? You know, let's say Michael Jordan, he can jump 40 inches. You know, God, <laughs> he can jump for, for Google trillion zillion, you know, there, there are no words. <laughs> we have so many people here who are PhDs. You know, I can't imagine studying that long, you know. I get headache even thinking about studying that long. Well, no matter how smart you are, or we might think we are, compared to God, what we know is just minuscule. Even the greatest mind, they're limited to their field. When we think about all the vast knowledge that exists, that people know, even compared to that, what we know is minuscule. But compare that to all the things that we don't know and we have not yet discovered. What about you know, the, all the stars and the moons and the, all the planets that we haven't even been to? The billions and trillions and the gazillions. So compared to God, there are no numbers. We don't compare. But I try to come up with a, an illustration that might help us to understand this a little bit. You know, what is a creature that we despise, that we hate? that really doesn't do anything for us. It, it just makes things dirty, gross, disgusting. I'm sure we all have, we might have different answers, but for me, growing up, growing up in the state of Texas, the most disgusting, gross thing that, that uh, uh, people consider to be in, in the state of Texas is roaches, cockroaches. Do they have that in India, cockroaches? Yeah, yeah okay. I know they have it in Korea, and people freak out, and, but you know, I look at the roaches in Korea, I'm like, dude, that's like a little pet. <laughs> roaches in Korea is like this big, and it's like really round, and you know, it's a little cute little thing. <laughs> you go to Texas, you'll see a roach, okay? In Texas, roaches come this big, and there are two different types. There are indoor roaches, and there are outdoor roaches. Indoor roaches are this big, but outdoor roaches, they're not only this big, but they can fly too. Can you, do you know that? They fly. They carry, you know, I'm told that they carry germs and diseases and so forth. And in Texas, really, you know, uh, in every house, in every cabinet and pantry, you'll see at least two or three cans of not only mosquito sprays, but road sprays. Every household has one of those. I mean, we hate them. We want to destroy them. It's disgusting, disgusting looking. It carries diseases, germs. It makes things look bad and it's yucky looking. Everything, all of those things. And imagine... One of you is saying, you know what, oh poor roach, you know what, I'm going to choose to give up my life as a human being. I'm going to stop, exi I'm going to stop existing as a human being and I'm going to choose to become a, and live my life as a cockroach from now on. That's unheard of. That's unheard of. That's unimaginable. Who would do that? Who would trade their life as a human being? Who would choose to give up their life as human being for the rest of their lives and say, you know what? I'm going to live the rest of my life for these cockroaches. It's unimaginable because there's no one that would choose to do that. But in, you know, furthermore, to say that I want to become a cockroach, why? Because I want to sacrifice my life as a human being being married with children, going on vacation, eating nice food, wearing good clothes, being able to watch nice TV, live a good life. I want to give up all of this to be a little bug that runs around in the dark, being chased around by this, you know, big adult human creatures with a can in their hands going, I want to give up my life as a human being to become a bug like that. Why? 
because I want to save the, the cockroach the population, the entire cockroach race. That is the reason why I want to do that. It's very funny because that's so stupid, unimaginable, because we know that in our hearts, no one in their right minds, okay? There might be some crazy people that might think that. But no one in their right minds would ever choose to do that. Well, let me just say this. That's exactly what God did for us. You multiply that by one gazillion times. For God to become man is far greater than us becoming a cockroach. See, that was an ultimate act of humility and humiliation. To choosing to forsake, to give up, to give up this authority and nature of being God and choosing to become this weak, finite creature called humanity. Secondly, God becoming man was also the ultimate act of love. When you think about all of these things, it makes so much sense. I mentioned this, I think, a couple of weeks ago. But as a parent, there are many parents here. There's nothing that makes parents, more feel, makes parents feel more helpless than to see his or her child being sick. Nothing. You might not have lots of money, but you can always tell yourself, you know what, I'm going to go get a part-time job at the local 7-Eleven. Your child might make bad grades, but you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay up extra two, three hours and I'm going to help tutor my children. Your child might not have too many friends. Then you say, okay, I'm going to become, I'm going to play with my son and daughter. I'm going to become their friend. There are always answers. But nothing makes parents feel more helpless than to see a young baby, a toddler, overcome with sickness. Because really there's nothing we can do. As a parent, you see your child who is normally very energetic, very excited, very talkative and playful. And then one day you find your child, son or daughter, all of a sudden that energetic, joyful, playful child, all of a sudden you see that child being weak, barely being able to talk, they won't eat their food. And they don't even want to move or, or do anything. And as a parent, you feel so helpless. You, you give the medicine. But you know what? Oftentimes, like mo most sickness, it has to take its course. Medicine just helps to alleviate some of the symptoms. But it doesn't cure the sickness. As a parent, I've gone through that. As a parent, I know that all of you have gone through that. And I know that on many occasions, when I, when I see my son and daughter, it just breaks my heart. Because at least if they're older, you can talk and you can communicate and you can find out that, yes, you can get that reassurance that, yeah, they're, they're doing a little better, they're doing a little better. If your child is a little bit older, at least through communication, you, can, you, you realize, well, they can bear it. They can endure it. But when a baby or when a little young toddler goes through that, there's this utter sense of helplessness. And when my son and daughter was young and when they were sick, in my mind, I've gone, this went through my mind many times, only if, if only, if only I could do something. If God were to grant me one wish, other than to simply make the illness go away, if there's anything that I can do to make my son or daughter get better, what would it be? If God would grant you one wish, other than simply making the illness go away, what would it be? I know what my answer was. And I know what your answer will be. 
On many occasions, I would ask God, God, if only if I could trade places with my child. Because my son and daughter, they're young, they're infants, they're, they're, they're a child. They don't know any better. And they're not strong enough to endure this the way I can. My son and daughter has fever. They're coughing. They cry. They have no energy. But God, I'm an adult. I can handle this better. I may be sick, but I can endure this better. And on many occasions I said, if only, if only you would allow me to take, switch places and allow me to take the place of my son or daughter. See, that is the heart of a parent. That is the love of a father. That is the love of our God. When God in heaven saw His children and His creation living in sickness called sin, I know because this is the nature of a father. I know that that God was overwhelmed and overcome with great love and compassion. Watching His creation, His children, whom He created for relationship, to love, and yet He sees them in sickness called sin. And that love, that fatherly love, that parental love that God had for us, it moved Him. It compelled Him. Say, you know, you don't know much better. You may not appreciate all the things that I'm doing for you right now. But because I am God, because I am holy and pure, I cannot do anything in this form. But because I am God, I can make myself become a flesh and blood like you. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go and become a man in a person of Jesus so that I can take your place, so that I can take away, take all your sickness and put it on me. You see, that's what happened 2,000 years ago. God sent His Son, Jesus. Son means it's part of Him, part of His flesh. There's divineness. Because that's the words that only humans can understand. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, to take away all our sins. Because God could not do it in the form of deity in heaven. But He could as a flesh and blood, as a man. Because He loved us. Because His love for us compelled Him. That is the reason why God became man. And when, when this truth, when I realized this truth, if you can imagine, it made so much sense. I mean, I knew it to be true, but I just could not figure out why this was so true. And when I did finally figure it out, oh, my love for Him. My love for Him just grew exponentially. And I just, the only thing that I can say was, God, I love you. And thank you. I'm going to close with a one final story that really illustrates all the things that I said you know, in a perfect way. Again, this is a story just to make this point. You know, one day in the courtroom, a judge sat, a judge sat stunned, shocked, as he saw his own son standing before him, charged with a horrific crime. As a judge, the father had to do what was right and serve justice, ser and serve justice, and sentenced his own son to 30 lashes with a whip on his back. 
After he handed down the sentence, the judgment, the judge slowly got up from his chair, took off his judge's robe, and came down from the bench. He then declared, As a judge, I did what I had to do. But as his father, I have decided that I will take my son's place instead and receive the 30 lashes. This is what God did. He had to punish sin because he is God of justice, who is just and who is holy. But as our Father, our Maker, God chose to come and take our sins and take our punishment as our Father. Why did God become, why did God come in a person of Jesus? Because God is just, God is holy, and God is love. And this is why we worship and adore Him. Amen? Amen. Let us pray.